We're live. We are. I hope we're actually live this time. I hope so too. Last time, last time we did this, we hit live and then we managed to not go live. Exactly. But um, I think, well, I'm, I'm hoping we're live. So yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for hopping on. Um, sure. How you doing today? It is great. It's off to a good start. How about you? Yeah, not so bad. I'm uh, I'm pretty excited to to finally have this chat with you. Um, we've kind of been discussing for a little while now what exactly we'll be talking about, and and um, we'd actually met. I guess it was over a year ago um, yeah. in a in a different background. But um, thanks for joining today. My pleasure. So I think for for the audience here, we've had almost 500 people sign up, um, which is a pretty good uh, number. This is, I believe, our 14th iteration of Behind the Future. Behind wow. the Future was a, yeah, I know, pretty good, right? Not bad for an enterprise architecture uh, podcast. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so the concept of Behind the Future is we talk about the, the mechanism that will bring about uh, the future of technology mm -hmm. and, and business. Um, and I think you know, coming from a, an architecture um, platform vendor, we kind of see enterprise architecture as one of those mechanisms. And um, the topic that Thales and I, you and me will be discussing today is uh, what's your secret sauce or the power of capability-based planning in enterprise architecture? Um, my name's Griffin, as you can see in this, uh, in this little legend. And, um, I'm a sales manager at RDoc, and uh, I've been the host of the U.S. version of this of this little podcast for a couple iterations now. Mm -hmm. So, Thales, why don't you tell us about you? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, uh, Griffin. This is uh, nice to be here. Um, yeah. So, a little bit about me. I guess um, the sort of uh, one of the unique things about my my background is um, actually I began my career as a professional architect, and so that's. Uh, sort of a big steel, big concrete kind of construct. Um, sometimes people say, oh, a real architect, and um, uh, I'll take that. Um, but I realized, you know, uh, sort of cutting my teeth on the CAD CAM scene there that uh, as we were inventing the internet uh, a few years back now, um, that there was an opportunity to really sort of port that skill set into the um, enterprise space and, and really sort of start to bring that rigor and discipline into the uh, technology landscape. And so I pivoted about 25 years ago and um, maybe the first to mark to do so. Uh, but I've really been focusing on enterprise architecture and architectural sort of uh, discipline, rigor, design constructs, et cetera, um, since then. Um, I've moved uh, to, uh, did a couple of startups in the Bay Area, but uh, moved to uh, New York here about 20 ish years ago and have been working with a bit of uh, the who's who on the financial services scene here in Manhattan and abroad as well. Um, but uh, really, the whole uh, time have been really trying to, you know, lean in on that maturation story around uh, why do we care about architecture? How does it help us? Uh, what is it? Um, you know, how do I understand it better? And, uh, and that's proven to be pretty successful. Um, you know, the first couple of years was a bit of an uphill battle. Uh, but uh, the last few years, we seem to be getting some traction in the space. And that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty satisfying to see. Nice. Thanks for that background. Yeah, I think that echoes conversations we have. Um, enterprise architecture is getting a renewed uh, look um, from, from companies in the U.S. and, and globally. Um, that's pretty interesting, though. So you started as a real architect, you know, architecting buildings and, and then moved into the technology space. Do you think there's are there a lot of similarities between real architecture and uh, technology architecture? Well, I think my comment there would be that we're designing things as opposed to architecting them, but um, <laughs> well, I'll let that go. That's my pet peeve. Um, yeah, no, I think that the constructs are very similar. I mean, you know, architecture is really around um, developing a solution that's fit for purpose to meet the, the, the whoever the client is, the client's expectations around uh, requirements, be they performance or functional or something else. Um, there's budgetary constraints, there's complexity management, there's typically a multidisciplinary engagement. It's not just the application, but it's also the uh, infrastructure stack that it sits on. It's the security overlay around that environment. It's the operational interaction with that environment, care and feeding, uh, things like um, you know, multi-site um, support, 
disaster recovery, high availability. These are all pretty common concerns, certainly in the financial industry, and maybe not mm. as much elsewhere. But um, I think any any regulated industry probably has those concerns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think you know it's really about um, you know seek first to understand, then to be understood, right? So you really want to sit with your client and, and understand what they're trying to accomplish. And then, um, you know, any good design will typically have some constraints as well. You have to uh, have something to guide your hand, as it were, to, uh, you know, determine what makes one, uh, you, you may develop multiple options and what makes one option more uh, enticing or, or meaningful or valuable than another. And that might be time to market, it might be feature function, it might be client experience, it might be a risk profile, it might be availability considerations, it might be latency, it might be all those things. Um, but typically it can't be all those things because, uh, well, simple things like time to market might be more expensive than say saving the saving money uh, as being a primary mm -hmm. driver. But, um, you know, uh, th there's sort of this framework of, of conditions within which you want to try and quote, solve the problem and uh, yeah. develop a solution. Yeah. yeah, I think something you said to me once, the primary output uh, for an architect is clarity. And I think that really resonated with me um, because you have to take this extremely complex thing, whether it's a building or, you know, a modern enterprise and then distill it into a language that people understand. That's um, it. Yeah. yeah, I think that, you know, architecture is... Um, you know, it means different things to different people. And sometimes it adds more confusion than it does, you know, clarity, but it's it's kind of a fractal concept where you have uh, architecture, very small things uh, like the, the chip architecture. Uh, you have the, you know, the compute frame architecture. Um, you have circuit board architecture, uh, but then you have, you know, the uh, application running on that. That's at a certain design considerations. How do these things interact? And then, of course, you add more and more machines and now you have an enterprise or at least uh, uh, an ecosystem um, that has an architecture unto itself as well. However, um, in terms of thinking about what to develop, that's not really a technology conversation. Um, mm -hmm. What to develop is more of a capability conversation as opposed to how will we solve the problem to execute what we want to develop. And that is more of a technology discussion. So right. there are different angles on that uh, architecture. And, and, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we can be lazy with our, our language, but sometimes we have to qualify these things more specifically. So whether it's yeah. a technology architecture conversation, business architecture conversation, or some other flavor uh, of, uh, of design. Yeah, that's, that's a good segue into our main topic. Um, and so I want to kind of start from square one. The, this talk is called What's Your Secret Sauce? The Power of Capability-Based Planning in EA. Um, but I want to level set for everyone. What exactly is capability-based planning in your words, Felix? Sure. So, um, you know, what is a capability? It's literally the capacity of an ability. Um, so it's, a, it's the ability to do something, um, whatever that something might be. Uh, in the technology space, um, the whole reason we invented this technology is to automate things that we do. And those things that we do, we can typically describe as a process. And so I like to think about um, capabilities in the same uh, sentences as, as processes, where you may have a process of, um, I'll just say, uh, juggling. Uh, that's a capability. Um, you can talk about it sort of... Um, generically, but when you run the process, now you're juggling and you're actually delivering the juggling capability. Hmm. And so, um, you know, when we talk about how we think about designs, we want to talk about, well, what are we trying to accomplish? What sorts of things are we trying to satisfy? What are we trying to do that we can automate? And that might be a bunch of different processes um, or capabilities. And the capability conversation, of course, allows us to talk about what we want to do uh, rather than how we're going to do it immediately. Once we settle on what we want to do, then we've got that clarity that we were talking about a little earlier. And now we can set about solving the problem about how to deliver what we want to do. Yeah. And it, there is kind of a fine line between a capability and a process. Um, and I think it's funny as, as I talk to architects and, and they say, oh, we want to do, you know, um, uh, capability mapping or something, and then they'll share with us like an APQC model, which is a process model. So I, there's kind of a, there's a, 
uh, people are blurring the lines. I, I think something that we talked about was like a capability is sort of a, a frozen set of time. And then a process is like, uh, you know, a time frame across which you can execute on a, a capability or a capability is, you know, what you're doing and then the process is how you're actually doing it. Right. Yeah. I'm looking at the same commentary in, in, the, in the comments as well. Um, yeah. And we could have a, a, a certainly, I'm sure, a lengthy uh, discussion about uh, how better to describe that. But, you know, it's an interesting aspect because the whole thing, we're using words to describe what, how we're thinking about things. And sometimes those the meaning of those words align, sometimes they don't. And that's one of the challenges around capability uh, yeah. modeling, is that you have to agree on what the words mean in the first place. So typically you want to have a definition to go with, you know, a capability um, about what that thing is describing uh, be, so that we all agree that we're talking about the same thing. Um, you know, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet, but once you have this capability model, um, I like to think about it as you can use those, those words to tag different things, to help describe the different things and that association with those things. And, um, but uh, we need to, and, and by, by, by assigning those tags, of course, they become part of the metadata associated with those things, and essentially reference data. And what happens with reference data, of course, is that, that it populates and propagates uh, throughout your systems. And um, so you wanna be pretty careful about how you name things at the front end, because you can be pretty sure that those names are gonna stick and make its way into your systems and become pervasive. And if you name something incorrectly, um, you know, you're going to have to undo that damage downstream. And that might be more trouble than you think it's going to be. Yeah. yeah. Something that we um, that we had discussed, with, like, before I guess we get into the granularity of, of the naming conventions, let's talk about the, the sort of high-level value that a company can get from a capability model. Um, and I think one sort of lens that we talked about that was... Um, you know, what do capabilities look like at a legacy bank um, versus some of these sort of modern fintech or like single line businesses? Sure. Well, I think um, actually one of the comments in the, in the side here is talking about, you know, business capability versus technical capability. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that's a more specific description of the nature of a capability. And it's, it's mm -hmm. a valuable one, too. Um, typically, as, as you mentioned, so legacy banks, we talk about things like you know, check processing or payment processing or customer onboarding or, you know, your client KYC kind of um, uh, documentation, things like this that are um, obviously profoundly repeatable um, and highly scalable. Um, but the things with the, the, the legacy banks is that they had to do everything themselves. Um, mm -hmm. So if you start back in the days when um, you had maybe multiple lines of business, maybe you had auto loans and you had home loans and you had regular deposit uh, platforms. Uh, that might be three different lines of business. And a million years ago, um, they each had their own email system. And then someone said, hey, hang on a second, we don't need three email systems. Why don't we just have one email system, a shared service, right? And so that notion of that mail capability um, by, by adopting, by, by rationalizing them into a single one, that's the whole application rationalization conversation. Mm -hmm. um, if you broaden that into a larger legacy bank, they basically had to do everything themselves, uh, whether that was um, uh, these sort of product centric um, you know, deposit loan lending capabilities uh, or things like compliance, finance, risk, technology, all sort of commodity capabilities that you have to do, but it doesn't mean that you have to be the expert in them. And so mm -hmm. as we start talking about capability modeling for uh, legacy banks, some of these things that are um, in the commodity space are really opportunities for some of the fintechs um, and then non-fintechs too, uh, to go after and say, you know, rather than, um, you know, all banks need to have an HR platform, right? Doesn't mean they need to be in the business of maintaining HR code though. So along comes something like Workday and says, hey, we can do this better, faster, cheaper than you can. And by the way, we'll just offer it to you as a SaaS platform. Hmm. Fantastic. Um, not very much fun for the people who are maintaining the HR code at the bank, but maybe there's a job for them over at Workday now. Mm -hmm. um, so things of that nature, um, you know, that it's that sort of decomposition of that capability space from a sort of um, core uh, product slash competitive differentiation uh, segment versus the commodity stuff that you just have to do. Um, mm -hmm. That commodity stuff presented the first opportunity 
for um, you know fintech like SaaS like uh, companies, but you know even some of the core the core products like deposits and lending, because there's so many banks that provides another commodity capability that mm -hmm. now you don't even have to be in the business of maintaining your lending platform to do loans mm -hmm. as a bank because maybe somebody else is doing it better, faster, cheaper than you can. Mm -hmm. And so you can just consume that lending capability as a third party SaaS or on-prem, what have you. Um, and then you don't have to be in the business of ma maintaining that code. So then it does beg the question, well, what are you doing for a living? And right. uh, this takes me back to the uh, 20, 30 years ago, I was in Napa Valley and I met this guy and he said, hey, I've got this, <clears throat> this, um, this newsletter and it's got all these advertisers in it. I kind of want to bring them together in like a portal. And I said, great, let's talk about that. I said, do you want to like be in charge of the website design? Because we can probably outsource that. He says, I don't want to do that, outsource that. Well, how about the content creation? No, I don't want to do that either. I said, well, how about the matching capability? No, I don't want to do that either. Well, do you want to do any of this or should we just outsource the whole thing? I mean, except for cashing the checks. And he says, that sounds great. And I said, and we can probably outsource the check hashing as well. I says, you know, you got a job. <laughs> And so, you know, it's really about what's your sort of core capability that you need to be in the business of maintaining. Yeah. And, you know, banks, um, to generalize wildly, um, they do three main things, right? It's customer intimacy, uh, relationship management, uh, it's liquidity management, and it's risk management. And really, those are the three main things. Now I'm generalizing else. profoundly, but everything else is arguably outsourceable. Yeah. Yeah. So. And I, I love that story. And it kind of points to how a capability model can give you the framework, but also the language to kind of dive deeper. Um, we, you know, speak with architects and they rank capabilities on maturity and market differentiation. And so it's those where you have a high differentiation, but a low maturity that you want to be focusing on um, right. and, and sort of the inverse that you could potentially outsource. Uh, I have one follow-up question before we go to the next topic, mm. uh, but I think a common thing that we get asked about is m and How can capability planning help in an M&A sure. scenario? 100%. Well, it's it's really uh, very similar to what we just talked about with the three lines of business in a bank. Um, some of the opportunities of, make, of acquiring um, people in a similar businesses or potentially complementary businesses, but the idea is that you're acquiring um, a, a large footprint of the ostensibly clients interested in what's being provided. <clears throat> and there's opportunity for you to take cost out of doing that by buying the company and then consolidating the systems that are redundant uh, and or retiring one and keeping another and migrating whatever from the one to the other. Uh, but you end up with um, a much larger client base with a fairly, I'm, I'm typically incrementally expensive um, technology infrastructure to support them. Mm. And so in terms of driving your operational efficiency, you're maintaining that, uh, or rather you're increasing your, your revenue flow while maintaining or only modestly increasing your uh, technology overhead to support that. And so that's a typical mm. M&A um, application, yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, okay, let's, let's charge on where there's a few more things that we wanna cover. Um, I, I wanna ask a question that I think um, other architects might be wondering, but where do you see capability-based planning fitting into like an overall enterprise architecture team or overall enterprise architecture strategy? Right. Well, again, it, it lets you talk about things without solving for the things you're talking about. And so um, you mentioned an interesting uh, case in terms of rating in this year, particular uh, example was mat maturity of a, a given um, ability to do something. Uh, likewise, you can, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a tag that you can assign to a lot of different things. Likewise, you can assign, assign tags to the capability. And so uh, one capability, you might give it like a risk profile, right? Uh, you might give it um, a cost profile. You might give it an annual investment amount. You might give it an annual OPEX amount. Um, you might associate a portfolio of applications with a given capability. Um, you might uh, associate a bunch of processes and or cap uh, applications um, together against the capability. Uh, Headcount, products, consumption, uh, all these things um, that are both actual things, but also descriptors um, can be associated with uh, the, these capability um, uh, constructs. Very similar to applications, right? An application has kind of got an arbitrary, uh, I'll say envelope of containment 
uh, things that are described by an application. And likewise, a capability has another arbitrary envelope of things that you can associate with it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's really about establishing, you know, connectivity, kind of like a graph, um, but connectivity of all the things with all the things and all the descriptors. Um, and so uh, the more, of course, the more things you have, the more information you have and the more ways you can slice and dice it. Which brings me to my, my, uh, my beautiful crystal, uh, where you can um, essentially develop this model of all the things and how they interact uh, and how we describe them uh, and how you can filter and sort um, about different characteristics and or um, uh, in this case capabilities. Uh, and regardless of you know which lens you're looking through uh, for use of the information, be it operational or risk or application development, app, uh, app rationalization, mergers and acquisitions, um, financial, uh, regardless of what lens you're looking through, you'll all be looking at the same set of information. And so you should have mm -hmm. consistency around the conclusions that you're able to reach with the data model that you're looking at or interrogating. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's, um, that's how I think about, uh, you know, these things with respect to enterprise architecture, strategy, um, ex uh, uh, execution, augmentation, uh, efficiencies, uh, risk. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, that makes sense. I, I, I like that um, kind of analogy of a multifaceted jewel. Um, uh, I was going to, I think, you know, we we try to enable or we see successful architecture teams as ones that are kind of advisors to the C-suite, but also informing, you know, the, the development of, of individual solutions. Um, and I think as an EA team, you're just looking for a compelling language to discuss potentially con complex concepts um, with the C-suite. And so uh, if you kind of create this, this quote unquote jewel, you can have those conversations kind of from, from different angles and mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. be able to tell compelling stories. Um, I'll, I'll ask a follow-up that we touched on briefly before, but do you think, what are your thoughts on, on using a, an industry standard model um, that you can download from, you know, some, some reference website or actually developing one with the business, uh, internally. Build versus buy. Um, yeah. again, I think it depends on, you know, whether you can do it better, faster, cheaper than someone who's already done it. Um, yeah. you know, you, you're going to evaluate a, a built model. Um, you're going to evaluate somebody else's language about how they describe the things in the model. And if that language resonates with you and your and your business stakeholders and colleagues, then there's probably no downside in adopting it. And in fact, there may be upside in that you're not creating yet another version of very similar things. Um, on the other hand, if the prefabricated model doesn't resonate with your client base, um, the likelihood of them adopting it is vanishingly small. Uh, people are people and they like the language that they like and they like using the words that uh, resonate with them. And so, uh, you know, I may say check processing and you may say check clearing. Um, are we talking about the same thing? Probably, but you know, not specifically. And so, um, you know, you're probably gonna settle on your language and I'm gonna settle on mine and they're not the same. Mm -hmm. So I yeah, think there's, goes no, back there's to that, no downside, yeah. Yeah, it goes back to that granularity um, uh, discussion, right? Like you, you need to, identify the level of granularity that you're working at upfront. And so if the level of granularity is very small, then you probably do need to get in the minutia, you know, define check clearing versus check processing because it really matters. But if you're having a conversation with, um, you know, right. Someone... And we talked about the granularity discussion, right? Where you can have a high level concept um, and a relatively non-specific description and then you can decompose that into like a level two level of granularity and specificity and sometimes three or four levels deep, depending upon how, um, you know, all encompassing that high level notion is. Mm -hmm. um, so I could have a, you know, uh, I'm in the construction business and so I have a capability of building things. Well, you know, you can build a lot of different things, a lot of different ways. And so we might have to describe it a little more specifically. <laughs> right. And, and that could take us the down. Building to things level. capability. Yeah. Yeah, there, I'm seeing some really good questions pour in it. And so we're going to carve out time um, from half past onward to answer these questions. But there's there's one or two more things I want to hit on uh, with you. Sure. So um, the next topic, and I think this kind of dovetails from what we were speaking about before, 
but how can architects or enterprise architects best drive value awareness from execs either using a capability or, or using a capability model or not? Sure. So I think um, the, the beauty of the capability model, of course, is that to a large degree, you're abstracting any kind of com technical complexity into just um, you know a verbal description that a lot of people can find accessible, regardless of mm -hmm. uh, how technical they may or may not be. And so that's the beauty of describing the, the what rather than the how. And um, you need to be able to tell a, an engaging uh, and compelling story to your, um, your, your clients, be they internal or external, about why they should care about what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the, the nice things about some of these stories that I found useful anyways are, uh, you know, a lot of people, obviously, the obvious thing is like financial. Does that resonate? But, you know, in the finance, in the finance business, uh, risk is a big consideration. And so being able to describe in a meaningful way how these things, um, you know, can affect the risk profile uh, is useful. Uh, and that risk might be a function of complexity. Uh, it might be a function of, um, you know, financial products themselves, transactional uh, risk, counterparty risk, things like that. But um, there's all these things in play. And some, and, and increasingly at this point, certainly in, in most companies maturation, there's a system for everything, right? We're, 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 there's softwares everywhere. And so uh, we need to be able to describe how we think about that complexity of um, application space without being lost in the minutia of how these applications execute or what code framework they're running on or what you know chipsets they're executing on or what cloud they're running on. That doesn't, mm -hmm. executives don't really care. Uh, typically about those considerations, unless there's right. some major underlying theme, like, um, you know, are we running our critical workloads on a single cloud and there's a single point of risk failure, uh, mm -hmm. failure risk. Uh, you know, things like that would be probably interesting to them. Um, other than that, probably not so much. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, um, if I could summarize, it's, it's, you need to make sure that you are speaking a language that your executives care about. And then once you know what they care about, um, then you can kind of figure out how exactly you want to frame the conversation. Right. So, and, and I think that's true of anyone, not just executives. I think yes. you need to meet people where they are and use language that is meaningful to them and speak in the currency that they value, uh, whether that's time, money, risk, uh, popularity, um, you know, likes, uh, whatever it happens to be. <laughs> Social media influence. Yeah. That's it. Um, yeah, it's, if they care about cost, show them cost. If they care about reducing risk, show them reducing risk. Um, That's right. If they don't care about any of those, they want to get to market first, show them how to do that. Um, okay, one more quick topic and then we'll, we'll flip to Q&A. This is a recurring theme in, in the architecture world. Does EA need a rebranding in, uh, in your opinion? Well, I think... Um... You know, I don't know if you've seen that show of being John Malkovich, but um, if everyone's an architect, no one's an architect. And mm -hmm. so what does this term really mean? And is it being overused? And if it's overused and everything's an architect or an architecture, um, I'm not sure it's a very useful term anymore. Um, you know, it used to be a legally protected term, doctor, lawyer, architect. You didn't really get to t say that unless you run through a few hoops and jumps and tests and certifications. and and we've kind of lost that. It's coming back a little bit, um, but it denotes a certain level of confidence and ability um, that at least is meaningful in day-to-day -day discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so if I go to a doctor, I have at least some level of confidence that he can probably sew up the cut that he puts into me, that sort of thing. Um, I think the architecture term, again, is that it's such a macro micro conversation, right? It's, it's, it's a design level conversation. It's a governance level conversation. It's a strategy and planning conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be a very much a component level conversation. Um, but without sort of being specific about what we're talking about, I'm not sure it's very, very useful. And so I think um, in, in the interest of being relevant and, and, and useful, we need to be careful and mindful about the words that we do use and make sure that they are in fact meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, if the, if your stakeholder community has a pretty good concept of what architecture is and isn't and where it kind of starts and stops and what it means and where the value is, fantastic. Um, if not, you might be just as well off talking about change management or, um, you know, uh, 
incremental development or um, mergers and acquisitions, and you'd still essentially be talking about the same thing. Right. Yeah. No, that that makes sense, and I think to your to your first point, that's certainly something I've seen. There's a level of of I'll call it title creep. You know, an enterprise architect is this kind of prestigious title, and um, Tell me about I think. It. <laughs> <laughs> and so I know we often talk to enterprise architects, and when I hear enterprise architecture, these are architects responsible for, and I'll use your favorite verb, architecting the enterprise, not solutions. And so we often. Uh, you know, talk to enterprise architects, but they're they're very focused on on solution architecture. And I'm like, that's great, but I think you're a solution architect, <laughs> and it's that's a right. very different thing. That's and right. So I think that, and then that title group can lead to confusion among you know internally. So if you enter a meeting with an enterprise architect, but they're talking to you about mm -hmm. something a little bit more granular, you, you probably start to question the value or or at least the, the scope of the information you're getting. Right. Well, I'm I'm always um, somewhat amused by the um, vigorous discussions on LinkedIn or in the enterprise architecture space, um, almost questioning one's own identity. Um, am I supposed to be doing this? Am I doing this right? It's almost some imposter syndrome. And uh, that concerns me a little bit because you should, I think, have um, conviction of uh, your thought before um, you know uh, assigning it to your title. But um, I think the the enterprise is such a non-specific thing as well. It's, it, it's uh, all encompassing. Right, it's all encompassing, and so to claim ownership of that without being the CEO is um, certainly uh, aspirational. <laughs> um, but I, I, but but to be fair though, it's a meaningful role because it brings a level of visibility to a number of different things that most CEOs probably don't have visibility on at that level of granularity, and it allows us to systematize it and assemble a um, you know a, a robust. Uh, set of data sets and by commingling them really drive a lot of business intelligence that is probably otherwise inaccessible to uh, most executives. Uh, yeah. So I think that there is um, a legitimate value there. Um, uh, I think the challenge there is communicating it to people who don't understand um, sort of some of the, the um, you know, the, the minutia behind the, the broad construct. Yeah. And you, you said this before, you know, you need to be a compelling storyteller. There's this old saying, storytellers rule the world. And so I think the more we can enable um, architects to be storytellers, the, the more compelling conversations they'll have and, and, the, and the more they'll be able to influence the organizations that they're part That's of. right. You have to be a big part of what I do. And I think probably most of your audience does and whether they know it or not or, or, or tell, talk about it is it's really about being able to manage and think about and also communicate about complexity. Yes. Um, enterprises are typically pretty big and pretty complicated. <clears throat> and then in order to be able to talk about that in a meaningful way in a, uh, to, in a layman's uh, capacity, is really a very high value thing to be able to do. Um, and then if they want to dig a more deeply for detail, the ability to then quickly and easily produce that detail, again, in a meaningful and consumable way, is again, a pretty high value thing to be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I always say a little goes a long way. Uh, of uh, sort of architectural capability, um, mm -hmm. be that for designing, literally designing, uh, or whether it's from a strategic uh, management perspective or any sort of, um, you know, larger scale uh, efficiency or change management consideration. Yeah. Yeah. I have um, something that I, I've often said is that architecture teams with the, the most simple meta models are often the most impactful. And I think I agree with that to a degree. Like you obviously, it can't be too simple or you're going to lose out of some of the, the value that you're going to add. But I think having a simple meta model allows you, and, it, and it's hard to have a simple meta model because you are distilling complex things into you know fairly concise format. Well, I think it's a crawl, crawl, walk, run kind of notion. Um, yeah. Don't feel like you have to boil the whole ocean first before you can do anything. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the simplest model, of course, is a list. Um, right. Let's inventory some stuff. Uh, and then once you've inventoried that stuff, maybe you want to start to describe the stuff you inventoried. And so there's some metadata that you're going to assign to it. But maybe you then go, huh, um, this list is interesting. Um, I've got a list of things here, but someone's asking me how much those things cost to maintain every year. And well, now I have to go get another list. And that list is the, you know, the OPEX expense uh, footprint. And I have to associate it with the first list. 
Yeah. And by associating that, now I've got two dimensions of really quite interesting things, which is the things themselves and the OPEX associated with them. And then now you can do more than you could with the first list, but probably not as much as you could still do. And so if someone else comes along and says, well, I want to understand how much I spend on my riskiest things. Oh, well, do we have a risk profile for these things? If we do, fantastic. I can merge that with the, my list of things. If we don't, we're probably going to have to do a little bit of work here, assign some ratings to these things, and then we'll have our list of you know risk profiles. Yeah. Now I can sort by risk and tell you the OPEX. And so by adding an each additional dimension, you gain a great a greater depth of uh, you know accessible um, and relatable uh, information. Yeah. This is getting so interesting, but I do want to. We just have five or so minutes left, and I want to um, make sure we answer some questions from the audience. Um, so. I stand ready. I, I, I'll uh, I'll relay some. So I, the first one that I'm going to read to you is what uh, what maturity must um, an enterprise architecture function have before taking on capability based planning? Are there any necessary competencies or building blocks um, that have to be present? Uh, I'm going to merge that one with the last the one on top that says what's the right level of this kind of effort. Um, and I think my earlier comment is really, um, you can start anywhere and just don't feel like you have to boil the ocean. And so by making the very first list, I, the longest journey starts with a single step, right? And so just making a list of things, or if you want a list of capabilities that you're interested in, but don't feel like you have to boil the entire capability model either. Typically, these things are kicked off with someone asking a single type of question. And if you have the information, great. If you don't, you're gonna have to go get it. And, um, and then you're, you're gonna generate your first list of things. And uh, in doing so, you're gonna find out some other things that might be of interest along the way. You'll probably pick them up for the ride because you're in the neighborhood, right? But um, I don't think that you need to um, have any particular uh, expertise other than um, a willingness to, to learn about how to do uh, some of this investigation and association. And I guess the other comment I would make too is that you don't have to solve an enterprise model for a capability model uh, or even a micro ex uh, enterprise uh, architecture exercise to be useful. You can start off with a very focused exercise and then go, huh, I learned some key things here about the nature of inventorying these things, some of the metadata that goes with it, some of my sort of systemic requirements around supporting the information set. And I only looked at this very tiny little piece of our enterprise. But that those core f uh, findings are entirely scalable across the entire enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it goes back to that, so that fact starting on a little, you build out the model and then you can go, huh, now if I populate it with everything else, I now I've got a pretty cool model. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree. And I think that aligns with, you know, you want to start with an area where you can solve a business problem, but you don't need to start with everything. And then once you kind of solve that problem, then you can move on to the next one. Yeah, Something that exactly. we talk about here is death by repository where architects feel like they need to categorize everything before they can start doing anything. And you're never going to get there. You're never going to define every That's capability right. and how That's right. So you got to start small. And the other comment I would make too in that, in that vein is um, the levels, right? High, high level capability, level one, level two, level three. You almost never need to go past level three unless you're doing a very specific focused targeted investigation in which case sure go to level four three or four if you need to but you don't need to do it for everywhere you're doing it for that very focused exercise and you may have so you may have um you know the the the, the depth of your capability model may be quite inconsistent you might have 90 percent level ones uh you know 10 percent l2s one percent threes and you know ten, a tenth of a percent fours mm -hmm. Right. And then, and then you know, do you so have any, you have to dig deeper than now you've got, you know, two tenths of a percent fours. Right. Yeah. You can always, you can kind of, it's a, it's a, a living model, right? Like you can kind of yeah, you can build, build it out. Yeah. yeah. Do you have thoughts on, on, um, business versus technical capabilities questions from Prasoon? Well, that's a great, that's a great one because it used to be, um, oh, I'm in business and you're in technology and, uh, you're here to serve me. Um, and in and, and, and one way that was useful, but not very much, uh, I, didn't, I never thought so. Um, increasingly, you know, anyone in any kind of business has some minimal capability, technically speaking, if only from a consumption perspective. 
but increasingly, you know, m many, if not most, can code uh, in some capacity, even if it's only uh, like modest scripting. Uh, they can configure their platforms. Typically, they know how to, you know, make it do what they want them to want it to do. Um, so I think that we have to be careful about uh, the, the differentiation there. I find that the the useful part there is around accountability for decisions often. So uh, technology might be more responsible for delivery of something as opposed to accountable for payment of it or funding it in the first place or sponsoring its uh, requirements base. So I think that's probably a more useful way of thinking about it than it is um, this or that because it's going to be both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Hey, so we're, we're 10 minutes over our allotted time. Um, Thales, thanks so much. Let's put your email address right on the, on the bottom of the screen. Um, Great, yeah. If anyone has questions, they can email askthales at gmail.com, questions, comments, or, or anything else. Um, I really appreciate you doing this. I thought this was super interesting, and I, and I hope the audience learned something. I, know I hope it was I useful. Did. Yeah, I enjoyed it as well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good stuff. And then I want to make a, a quick comment um, for people still tuned in. Um, we have, RDoc has um, our uh, our Amplify series, which is on October 13th. It's a, it's a webinar. You can register on our website. And then this recording will be on our YouTube and also on our LinkedIn channel um, at some point later today. So, Thales, thanks again to everyone who tuned in. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, thanks all. Yeah. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye.